Hi guys, Olive here. Here today to answer some questions about books and about my life. This is the books and life tag that was created by my friend Steve Donahue. And because it was Steve who created this tag, all of these questions are nosy and in some regards, probably overly personal. So I guess let's just get into it. Steve gives himself away as the creator of this tag immediately because the first question is on a scale of one to 10, one being a normal person and 10 being the late Harold Bloom, how much are books and reading a part of your life? I have been sitting here for far too long trying to figure out how to answer this question because there's such a huge part of me that wants to say, I'm at a nine out of 10. You know, I want to be kind to myself in answering this question, but I've decided that I would be delusional if I gave that answer. I'm at least at a 10, if not edging toward an 11. Books and reading started taking over my life over the past maybe four to five years. Because when I started this channel, books and reading were more of a secondary thing in my life. I did a lot of reading, but I did not do as much reading as I do now. And I didn't engage with books in as many ways as I do right now, because I have this channel, which is a huge responsibility. It takes up a lot of time. And I'm constantly thinking about reading I can do for this channel. I'm reading things so that I can talk about them on this channel. But then I also have written reviews. I have books I need to read because I'm commissioned to write about them. I also have other bookish endeavors. Between September and December 1st, every single year, my life becomes all about nonfiction November. I run that every single year. It's a lot. And honestly, it's not something I love about my life right now. I think books and reading were already threatening to take over my life before the quarantine, before the pandemic began here in the United States. But I was kind of holding them back, keeping them at bay. I had a life outside of reading. It was continuing to shrink, but I still had something. I still had a social life. But then quarantine hit and whatever extra time I had, I willingly gave it over to books and reading, especially when I started writing more book reviews professionally. That kind of took over the remainder of my time. I feel like before the quarantine and especially like maybe two to three years ago, there used to be so much more balance to my life than there is right now. And it's really hard because I feel like the more I get enmeshed in the book world, the less I'm able to find my way out of it. Because there are people in my life who I really want to reconnect with now that everything is reopening, but it's hard to talk to them if they're not as much in the book world as I am, because I haven't watched the newest TV shows or movies. It's hard to talk about anything but the book world because I'm so surrounded by it. And I know no one else is this deep in the book world as I am. So it becomes hard to talk to people. So it's just this cycle where it just keeps getting worse. So at a certain point, I have to pull myself out of this. So it's something that I'm actively working on. The biggest thing that I'm trying to fight against is this overwhelming sense of guilt when I'm doing anything that doesn't revolve around books. I feel guilt because I feel like I should be spending all of my time being good at all the different things that I do. I should be investing time so that I can be good and get better. That is what I do. I just work myself to death. <laughs> I have to give myself permission at some point to ease off books because it's not like I don't have other interests. I mean, as you can probably tell by all the different books that I read, I have so many interests. I have way too many interests, to be honest with you. I just have to give myself permission to explore some of those. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to quiet the feelings of guilt and invest my time in things that make me happy that don't involve books, like the WNBA, for instance. I have really, really been getting into the WNBA over the past couple of months. I bought access to what is called League Pass. It's like 15 to $20 for an entire season. You can watch some games live. Some of them you have to wait a few hours until after they go live on their respective networks, but then you can watch replays of them. I've been watching those games. I've been getting to know the players. I'm now a Washington Mystics fan because Tina Charles is incredible. It's just been such a wonderful thing in my life right now. I've been watching games. Right now they're on a break for the Olympics. So I've just been going back and watching the older games because I can do that since I have League Pass. 
And I give myself that hour every single night to watch a game and not think about books. I don't think becoming a fan of the WNBA is going to cure me of this. I don't think I'm automatically going to find balance because I have this new interest, but I'm taking the fact that I haven't felt this excited about something that doesn't involve books in a really long time as a good sign. I have a lot of work still to do, but hopefully in the very near future, my answer to this question will be a seven to eight out of 10 instead of where I am right now. Question number two is a multi-part question. Where does your personal library stand in relation to the rest of your life? Do you have more books right now than you ever have? Fewer? How has your library changed? Oh, I definitely have more books now than I ever have before, but that's not something I'm ashamed of. It's not something I think is a problem because I knew when we moved here, I was going to have more space for books. This is the biggest place we've ever lived. My husband and I, it's probably the biggest place I've ever lived, period, I think. And I knew when we were going to move here that I was going to be able to dedicate this entire room to books. This is my reading room. It's my studio. It's my office. It's a multi-purpose room, but its main purpose is to store books. I have a lot of space in here for books. They're kind of everywhere, but not so much that it's cluttered. It's not a problem. There are just a lot of books in here. I have a ton of books. I'm not going to be dishonest about that, but my book collection has never really been a problem in our living space because I'm very good about getting rid of books. You don't really see it a whole lot on this channel, but I'm getting rid of books almost constantly. If you see me hold up a book here on my channel, if you see me talk about it over on Instagram, the chances are good if I've read that book and I give it a review that I'm going to sell it unless I definitely want to reread it, unless it was like a dazzling five-star read, or unless I think I might need that book for reference purposes sometime in the future, I'm probably going to be selling it to my local used bookstore. It'll turn into credits and I'll get new books that then you see in one of my haul videos. It's a nice little cycle. But the question about how my personal library has changed over the years is an interesting one. Because when I was thinking about it, I think in prior years, the collection of books I have on Russia, like my Russian history books, I have a big collection of Russian history books. That used to be a much more dominant part of my personal library because there are so many of those books. I used to be really focused on building that collection. So library book sales or used bookstores, I'd pick up pretty much any book on Russia that I saw. Well, eventually when I started going to the used bookstores and library book sales, I would go to the Russian section and I had all of those books already. So I've stopped acquiring so many books on Russia. It's kind of leveled off. The only ones I'm adding to that collection are now mainly just new books coming out about Russia if I happen to hear about them. But I've become more interested interested in other topics. Since I started building up that collection, I started focusing on picking up nonfiction books and some fiction books that I keep over here. And so I think my collection right now is much more proportional. I think I have as many normal nonfiction books as I do Russian history books. It just so happens that my personal library is changing a lot right now, though, like right in this moment because right now I'm doing this trash my bookshelves fiction unhauling project. I'm trying to cull my fiction collection, get rid of anything that I don't want to read. Because when we first moved here to Pittsburgh, I was acquiring a ton of fiction. I was reading more fiction at the time. So when I would go to the library book sales, I was going to to kind of learn my way around the city. I picked up a lot of fiction for really cheap. It was not expensive to build up that fiction collection. But now I've kind of drifted back to being the nonfiction reader I think I always was. And I just don't have much of a need for a lot of those fiction books. So I've enlisted the help of my viewers in helping me decide which ones to keep, which ones to get rid of. It's turning out to be a super fun project. I'll link the playlist down below if you want to join in on the fun. It's been a blast. And I think other people are having fun watching it too. So if I have to get rid of a bunch of books, if I have to say goodbye to them, then I'd much prefer to do it in a fun way like this. Question number three is, take a mental step back and ask yourself, what is the most likely first bookish impression a newcomer would have in your home? Well, the first bookish space a newcomer would encounter in this house is the sunroom which is where I keep a lot of my classic books, but then also the majority of the bird books that I own and some other nature books. This is not all of them by a long shot. I also have that room decorated 
with some nature things, but also mainly bird decorations. I have bird posters. I call it my bird corner. And so I'm assuming someone would say, if they didn't know already, wow, she really likes birds. And that would be correct. Question number four is how often, if ever, do you clean or reorganize your books? I do try to dust my bookshelves every so often, especially these ones behind me because they're the ones that appear on camera. So I like them to be tidy. But I'll sometimes maybe give the books a wipe down in the process of dusting. I normally don't need to do that. They normally stay in pretty decent condition. We have a dehumidifier on this floor, so I've never had to worry about mold or mildew. And as much as I love to organize things, I tend to leave my book collection as it is, unless there's some sort of a big change happening. And normally that means a move when all of my books are off the shelves to begin with. So that gives me a good opportunity to reorganize things and get them how I want them. But the books you see behind me have more or less been the way they are since we moved here. I haven't done a big reorganization project. However, because I am undergoing this big fiction calling project that I was talking about earlier, I'm getting rid of a lot of books on this far shelf. And once that project is done, I think it'll be in October, I'm going to use that as an excuse to take all of the books off of the shelves in this room. Besides the Russian history books, they're going to stay as they are. I don't need to reorganize those. But mainly all the nonfiction books I have in here, I have different nonfiction books in similar topics scattered all over the place. And I really want to organize them by subject. I think that's how I want to do it. So once that unhauling project is done, I'm going to take all the books off of the shelves, put them on the floor of this room. It's probably going to be a mess in here for a couple of days and reorganize everything and then put them back where I want them. I'm going to do a whole vlog about that. So you can keep an eye out for that in a few months. But then once those books are on the shelves the way that I want them, they're going to stay that way probably at least for a few years. It's just way too big of an undertaking to do that often. Question number five is on average, how many books do you acquire in a given week? It really does depend on the week because maybe this will surprise you, but there are a lot of weeks that I don't get any new books at all. No used books in the mail, no books I've ordered, nothing, no books from publishers, zilch. But then there are other weeks that maybe in the same week, I'll get a big Better World Books order that I've placed maybe a week before it arrives, or I'll wait until I have enough books to make a full order in my eyes anyway, of maybe 10 books, used books that I want or need for whatever reason. And then I do get books from publishers, probably not as many as you think, but I get a lot of sports books because I cover them for the Christian Science Monitor. I also do occasionally request books or I'm offered books by publishers to talk about here on this channel or on my Instagram. And then I do get a literati book once per month. But of course, he's asking for an average, mm, maybe between three to five. That sounds right. Three to five per week probably more like three these days because library book sales aren't going on. This next question, question number six, is another dead giveaway that this is a Steve tag because unsurprisingly, it's completely unrelated to the rest of the questions in this tag. He asks randomly, what song is your current earworm? Per our dynamic though, I'm going to figuratively grab Steve by the ear and drag him back on topic because believe it or not, I have a bookish answer to this question. There's this song that I used in a reel that I recently posted on Instagram. They're just like little short videos in case you've never heard of that, in case you're not familiar with Instagram. But over the July 4th weekend, I went up to City Books, which is a used bookstore up on Pittsburgh's north side. I went there with my husband. We shopped a little bit and I got some footage inside the store and I posted that footage in a reel on Instagram. And the song I chose for that reel is this song called Reluctant Readers Make Reluctant Lovers. And the band's name is Library Voices. It was too good to be true. It was so perfect. I had to use it. And ever since then, I've had that song stuck in my head. I've been listening to it all the time. It actually has to do with reading. It's not like a fallout boy song title where it's cool to say, but it doesn't actually have anything to do with the song itself. This song actually has something to do with reading. 
I will link it below for you if you'd like to listen to it. Question number seven is what percentage of your self-control do you retain in a well-stocked bookshop? It completely depends. It depends on how much money I have set aside for books. Sometimes I've recently bought a lot of books before a bookstore visit, so I'll be a little bit more conservative. And it also depends in a used bookstore specifically how hot the store is, not temperature wise, but if you shop a lot at used bookstores, you might understand what I'm talking about. Because sometimes you walk into a bookstore, you're ready to spend some money, and just nothing is calling to you. The books they have on offer, they're just not your types of books. So I've had a lot of occasions where I've walked out of a bookstore with absolutely nothing. And then there are other times you walk into a bookstore, this happens to my husband too, actually, it's like, Everything you want to read happens to be on the shelves and you walk out with just a pile of them. Like you need extra hands to be able to carry how many books you want to buy out of that store. I've had it both ways and I know that they're kind of equal. They balance themselves out. I have a certain amount of money that I'm willing to spend on books in a given month and they're used books. They're not quite as expensive. So I just kind of go with the flow. Question number eight is, do you ever feel the need to take a break from books? And if so, what form does it take? If this question means a long break from reading, like a big chunk of time in which I wouldn't do any reading at all, I don't do that. I haven't really done that and I've kind of lost the option to do that because I write about books professionally now. I'm a freelancer. I'm commissioned to read certain books and write about them. So taking a huge break from reading is no longer something I could do. At most, I'll take a day or two off if I'm feeling really burnt out and I feel like I just don't want to think about books or anything to do with books for a while. But most often what happens is that I'll take an evening off from reading or writing. That especially happens when I have finished a book earlier that day, especially one that I'm going to be reviewing. I like to take some time after I finish a book and just sit with it. I like to think about it. I like to give myself some time just to pull my thoughts together, especially if I'm going to be writing about it. I want to be able to figure out how I'm going to turn those thoughts into words to put down on a page. That takes some time. and I don't want to clutter my brain with other things. So if I'm taking some time off from reading, then other things I'll do are things like rewatching old reality TV episodes. So it's really mindless. I can just kind of zone out and not use my brain for a little bit. It does get to be a lot <laughs> doing a lot of mentally taxing work. So it's nice to just zone out for a little while. I do the thing I was talking about earlier, where an hour before bed, sometimes I'll just come up to our bedroom and put on a WNBA game. That has been really, really nice. And then if I'm taking a whole day off from reading, or if I'm just spending the evening with my husband, we'll sometimes watch a movie together, or we'll play a board game like Wingspan. Question number nine is when you meet a new person, how long does it take you to bring up books? Usually it doesn't take very long for me to bring up books in any topic of conversation because there will inevitably be something in our conversation that reminds me of a book I've read. And and I will say as much. But if they don't respond positively to me bringing up a book, if I get that heartbreaking, oh, that's interesting, when clearly they're not interested, then I will not bring it up again. Question number 10 is, have you given any thought or made any provisions for your personal library after you croak? So, so far in this tag, let's just recap. We've had an off topic question and we've had an unnecessarily morbid question. Yeah, this is definitely a Steve tag. However macabre the question, I will still give it an answer. I realized when I first read this question, like when he first created this tag, that I had never given this any thought whatsoever. Because don't get me wrong when I say this next thing, I do love my books. I value them, obviously. I appreciate them. They bring a lot to my life. But I don't make a habit of getting attached to physical things. I remember getting a new car and someone asking me, do you love it? And I was like, I don't get attached to depreciable assets. That's just kind of how I am. I don't have a lot of romantic notions about what's going to happen to all of these when I'm no longer here to love them and read them and appreciate them. So I guess the loose idea I have is that I want my loved ones, my friends and my family to take whatever books they want, whatever books would mean something to them. The rest of them sell them to a used bookstore. I would much rather these books be actively used by people who would love and appreciate them the same way that I would. And the final question, question number 11 asks, are you known among your friends and loved ones for your 
weird and probably unhealthy relationship with books. I sure am. I think the non-readers in my life have finally begrudgingly come to accept it, at least I hope they have by this point. And the readers in my life, even if they're not as voracious of readers as I am, I think they appreciate having me around because even if I've not read every book out there, I've heard about a ton of books because I'm in the book world, I'm on booktube, I've heard about even more books than I've read, which is already a lot of books. So if I've not read a book that they're potentially interested in, I can at least pass along the name. So I'm kind of a recommendation machine. So yeah, I'm the weird book person in most of my social circles, and I am totally okay with that. So that's it for the books and life tag. I will tag a few people in the description box below, some people who I think might be interested in answering these questions. But if you are interested in doing this tag here on booktube or on a book blog or wherever you want to do it, and you don't see your name on that short list, please feel free to do this tag. You can even say that I tagged you. Any comments or questions you may have about anything you've seen in this video or about anything in general can go in the comment section below. And if you would like to keep up with what I'm reading and writing about right now, you can find me on a variety of places across the internet, including Goodreads and Instagram. The links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I will see you in the next video. Bye.